Hey everybody, welcome to Ready, Set, Drone, and I'm going to say a big howdy to my pal B, who's visiting from California and imaginary filming. Hat. Oh yeah. I'm sorry, I tipped the imaginary hat. Uh, okay. We're in Austin, I mean. Uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, it was a cowboy hat, right? Yes. All right. I did it from here. So uh, B is visiting, and we're shooting some videos together. And B is a professional Part 107 certified FAA drone pilot. He is also uh, involved in a lot of projects, shoots for uh, fairly big brands around the world, has a lot of knowledge and experience in this area, also has his own YouTube channel that you should check out called Droner. But my point is, I'm going to do an interview with him today and ask some questions that I'm sure everybody wants to know about being a professional drone pilot and what that means. So stay tuned and check it out. First of all, just in 30 seconds or less, maybe 20 seconds or less, tell me what it means to be a professional drone pilot versus a hobbyist. Uh, a professional drone pilot is somebody who gets paid to fly. Excellent. That was less than 30 seconds. I like so, uh, so if you're out flying and you're just doing it with your friends and having fun, that's one thing. If you're getting paid to do it, mm -hmm. or I believe, according to the FAA, even if you're not getting paid but you are doing it for the purpose of promoting or uh, uh, marketing something, uh, whether that's real estate or marketing efforts for a business or something like that, even if you're not getting paid, that's considered professional work. And there's a bit of gray area, but it's probably smart if you have your license at that point. Yeah, it's better to be safe than sorry, for sure. Absolutely. So. Let's start with uh, some of the, the tips and tricks that you know. Um, what are some things you do in terms of maintaining and um, kind of steps you follow every time you fly? Yeah, I mean, first thing I'd say is that it's a huge, it is a huge benefit to have a team. Um, I am a professional drone pilot, but I am not my whole team. I'm not the person that's going to show up every single time. It's like by myself. I never show up by myself. I have a team. And that team's really important because having a community of drone pilots that you work with helps you keep the maintenance on your drones up, helps you keep updated on everything that's going on, and helps you to find you know, pretty much any errors that are going on. Just like flying an aircraft, every single time we fly, we have a pre-flight checklist. We go through, we're looking at propellers, looking for nicks on the propellers. We're looking for anything on the body that makes us feel uncomfortable, looking at the batteries, make sure there's no lumps, there's no punctures, there's nothing, especially on the batteries. Um, and also just going through and making sure all the systems are right, making sure our controls are right, and just going through and calibrating everything. Software is um, updated. Software is updated. Um, there's a lot to it, especially when you're flying the Inspire series. Um, it's not like flying a Mavic. You know, a Mavic is just like, boom, unfold it and it flies, like the Inspire. I mean, you'll run into the same thing, not to contradict, but the Mavic, I'll open it up, and if I haven't flown it in a couple of weeks, it might very well need software updates oh, or yeah. firmware mm -hmm. updates. And then you're like, oh, I wish I had done this before I came out here and had had all these people waiting <laughs> on me, you know? And that is the worst. Like, um, before you go out to fly somewhere, you know, there's two different times you do a checklist. There's one checklist at home. When you're like, hey, let's, like, I, I normally take my drone outside um, into my front yard. I make sure I just fly it, make sure it's okay, make sure everything's good, do a systems check the day before. Uh, make sure that all, everything's updated. Batteries you are wanna, charged, yep, firmware's updated. All of it. You gotta make sure everything is okay so that when you get to set, then you're not gonna have to deal with an issue that you could have dealt with the day before. Um, so that's a really big part of it is you know, doing all the pre-flight checklists beforehand and then doing it, of course, again the day of. Now you mentioned, uh, not, to, not to go into too much of a rat hole, but you mentioned nicks and propellers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of these people, my nature, my tendency is like to try and use something until it's just absolutely unusable. Mm -hmm. um, why would you want to get rid of a propeller if it just had a small nick or it was bent a little bit or something? Well, it can do a couple different things. One of them is it can cause drift um, in the way that it flies, and the other one is that it can cause your uh, drone to vibrate more. And the vibrating drone with the camera drone, um, that can cause issues with your image. And that's the biggest thing is like, it doesn't matter how you fly it. If you get a good image, then you're fine. As long as you're safe and you get the great image, then nobody cares how you flew. Um, so you have to make sure that the image, just like we said before, and like content is king, the image is queen. Uh, image is queen. Yeah, I'll say that. That's image good. is queen. Content is king. Um, king. Image is queen. Um, so you have to make sure that you take care of her and that um, the Nick propellers or having a propeller that's bent or something like that can influence your image quality. And you don't, you got to make sure that comes first and make sure your image quality is good. Fantastic. Um, what about, um, you know, knowing the laws and getting <laughs> permits and all that sort of thing? I mean, what, what are some things that, uh, like if someone hires you, what are some things you're going to help them uh, avoid you know, problems and such? Well, there's different kind of clients that um, hire you that have different levels of knowledge. Um, some clients know exactly, they've worked with drone companies before, they know exactly what they want, they've already gotten you the permits, they've already gotten the insurance, they just want you to show up and fly the bird. Um, those are the easiest clients, those are the ones I charge the least to, obviously. 
Um, but then you have clients who've never worked with somebody who does professional drone flying before. You have people who just don't know anything about that. And they'll say, yeah, let's go flying. Like one time I had a client that asked me to fly literally in front of the takeoff strip of an airport. I'm just like, nah, I can't, I cannot do that. Um, and that comes with you know being able to talk to them ahead of time and all that. But what you want to do is make sure that you are always on the, the best side legally you can be on. So even if the like you always want to, like you said, you have your part 107, and then you research the area. So the first thing I ask a client when they ask me, oh, can you fly this for me? I'm like, when do you want me to fly, and where do you want me to fly, and what do you want me to do? If you ask those three questions, then you can do your own when, research. When, where, and what? Yep, when, where, and what. If you ask whoa, those whoa, whoa. <laughs> the three Ws. And if you, if you ask those questions, then you can do the research to figure out, say, OK, cool, this, uh, if you take the part 107, you'll know how to look at sky vector, vector map and say, oh, I'm in class B airspace. I can't do this. Or I'm in class G. I can do whatever I want to do. Um, so you have to know exactly what kind of airspace you are, know if you're going to need to apply for any waivers of the FAA, and then you know, also what time you want to fly, because nighttime flying, you need to know the waiver for that too. So knowing when you're going to fly, what you're going to fly, where you're going to fly, how you're going to fly are all really important to be able to let a client know if it's even possible to do that. So you have to have, take the time to be able to look into the laws, look into the permits, and look into the airspace, because each municipality has their different laws. The 107 is a broad law, that go, I mean, broad regulation that goes across the entire United States, but it still allows room for in, individual muni municipalities to be to make their own laws. So you need to make sure that you look onto their websites and to their permits. Film permitting is normally the way that I look into it. Go to the film permitting people, they'll know. Talk to them and say, hey, I'm going to fly a drone in this area, blah, blah, blah. Is there anything special I need to do? Sometimes they'll say, no, you're fine. Thanks for letting me know. Sometimes they'll like, no, you need to fill this out. You need to prove this kind of insurance. You need to prove that kind of thing. And you have to go through the process and do it correctly. Nice, nice. Um, now, speaking of uh, clients, you mentioned about a uh, client you know, wanting you to fly in front of a, uh, the landing strip. Mm -hmm. um, what do you what how do you handle um, clients that are asking for something that they don't realize is dangerous or maybe they just don't care um, <laughs> how do you handle that situation that's actually an inevitable thing that's going to happen if you're going to be a professional drone pilot you're going to have clients that are going to ask you to do things yes you to do things that you're going to feel unsafe with that will happen there's always going to be a director a DP, a real estate person, whoever it's going to be, they're going to say, well, can you fly under that and then do this and then do this pull-off shot, but like, we can get really close in their face and then come back. And you, like, as a drone pilot, you have to recognize that you're the one who's professional. You're the only one there who knows what's safe and what's not when it comes to the drone. You are the one responsible for that. And you should never do anything that makes you feel unsafe. And the way that I cover myself um, professionally to allow that to work is that I talk to my client ahead of time and tell them, like, look, you know, Let's talk through everything that you want to do. And so we know everything that's going to happen beforehand. If anything changes on set. Document that. Exactly. You right. document it. Say, look, we talk about it. I've got this email. email right here. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and here's the email. Here's the things that we said we're going to do. And then when we get to set, if something changes, we say, hey, look, that's fine. But remember, like I told you, in the documented part is that if something does change and is, uh, I feel it's unsafe, then I'm going to let you know and I'm not going to do it. I'm not required to do whatever you tell me to do if, if it feels like it impinges upon anyone's safety, including mine or my drones. So as long as your client knows that it's something that you're willing to work with and not work with, they're actually, I've never had a problem after that. The only problems you run into is if you don't say it up front. If yeah. you don't tell them up front. It's called like, setting expectations. Exactly. Yeah. Set the expectations. That's a good life lesson, actually. Set expectations. Make sure the client knows that you will say no to them if they're doing something, if they're asking you to do something that's illegal or is unsafe? There, there is actually some power in the word no. Would you say that uh, you maybe get some respect sometimes when you tell a client no? You get a lot of respect because people realize that you're not, you're not joking around. You're not some kid that's just showing up with his drone to show off and make a little bit of money. Like they'll realize, like they're like, oh, we're going to do this, we want to do this, we want to do this. And you say, well, no, we're not going to do that because that's illegal for X, Y, and Z. And they're just like, oh, okay, you're a real drone guy. Like, yes, I am. That's why you're going to be paying me this much. <laughs> you know? So you just let them know and you set those expectations and that sets their expectation of how to treat you and how to respect you as a drone pilot and that makes it normally so they'll come back and they'll respect what you say when you say it to them so right they see you as the subject matter expert and and that's that's a good thing to be um, what about weather I mean it's <laughs> it's actually we, we went out this morning to try and fly and uh, canceled because of the weather um, yeah what, what, what are some things you should avoid in weather? I can't stand weather. Um, <laughs> but the things you should why, avoid That's why weather. you live in California, right? Exactly. I live in Southern California because <laughs> I don't like weather. Um, honestly, like, you know, the weather channel is your best friend. Um, you want to, whenever somebody tells you you're going to fly, I always keep an eye for the, you know, keep an eye on the weather, go heading up to it, looking at the winds, looking at the rain, looking at the, even the humidity because of how much humidity is in the air is going to change how your drone flies. 
Um, you still can fly with humidity and all that. It's just going to change how it flies. So I just like to be aware of it. I'm a little bit nerdy with that. But you really need to know if it's going to rain or the chances of the rain going to be. And you need to let your client know that too because they're not going to be thinking that. They're not going to be like, oh man, it's going to rain today because they're thinking like, oh, well, let's put a bag over the camera and we can shoot regular stuff. And yeah, the drone will be fine, right? No, drones normally cannot fly in rain. Like I won't fly my Inspire if there's any moisture around it because I have enough fun dealing with the maintenance and oiling that thing anyway. So I don't want to have to deal with getting water in those parts. So like, not going to happen. I'm just not going to fly. Uh, you know, I normally offer my client a backup day or something like that. But we also normally have That's a great, great idea. Yeah. Say, so look, have you know, this is our alternate day. If there ever is an issue with like, hey, it might not work this day. And again, set this. expectations. Set that. It, you know, say, hey, look, if there is bad weather next week when we're planning to do this the following Tuesday, we can do it again. Yep. Does that work for you? Exactly. Um, and if they say no, then you know you always have like, again, um, the way that you set it up and set expectations. Like, look, I told you that if it rains, I can't fly. I'm gonna get paid either way if we don't have a backup day. So you need to know this, well, this is gonna happen. So yep. Yep. Um, just setting that expectation and keep an eye on the weather. You don't wanna fly in high wind. Yeah, I was gonna say, right. wind, wind is one of those ones that, uh, you know, you could have a beautiful day, uh, sunshine and everything, but it, it could be super windy and, uh, yeah. Yeah, remember the queen. Like I said before, the queen is the image. And yep. in that image, you got to make sure that, like, if it's windy, like, an Inspire can handle some wind. Like, I've flown and done some pretty good shots in up to 40 mile an hour winds. Wow. I've done some pretty nice shots in it, but I wasn't able to do everything I wanted to do. And even more important is understanding a tailwind. If there's a, if there's a tailwind, even on a big bird like the Inspire, and you're going out and far away from yourself, even if you're in visual line of sight, which you should be, um, sometimes you might lose your battery on the way back because you're fighting the wind on the way yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. It's, back at it's, uh, it's way harder, it takes a lot more juice for it to get back than it did. Yes, yeah, so you yeah. need to be aware of it. You can still find wind. Um, just make sure your, your drone is rated for that and that you're comfortable doing it and that you pay attention to tailwinds and front winds. So there's a lot of good content out there about Part 107 and I don't want to belabor it um, because people can watch other videos. But just really briefly, what is Part 107 and, uh, and what's the very basics of studying or testing for it or getting right. ready for the it. The Part 107 is the test that the FAA gives you to uh, give you your commercial license to be able to make money legally while flying a drone. It um, costs like a hundred and something dollars, fifty dollars, one hundred seventy-five dollars, I think, to take the test. Um, it's a knowledge test. It's just you go into a center, you take a test, literally like on a computer, multiple choice. You don't have to write anything out. Um, and yeah, like I recommend you use RemotePilot101.com. Um, they are the best study source that I've been able to find. They actually allowed me to pass the test. It made it a lot easier than reading these huge manuals. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's not an easy test. Like the first time I took the test, I actually failed it because um, I didn't take it seriously and I had a, a big shoot happening the day before. So like I didn't study like I was supposed to and I showed up and failed it by one question. Wow. Yeah, so um, I highly recommend taking it seriously, learning the air maps, learning weather, um, and learning all the different laws involved with it. And Remote Pilot 101 is the way to go. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, working with clients, you know, you work with a variety of clients, I'm sure, you know, from big companies to maybe individuals, real estate, et cetera. How do you price, how do you price drone flying, you know, and, and with that, being cognizant also of wanting to get the value, but also not wanting to price yourself out of jobs? Exactly. Um, well, I actually did something that I, um, I think is interesting. I learned this in business school. Um, is what I did, because um, it's a really hard question to figure out, like how much do I charge to do this drone thing? Um, first thing I had to figure out was like, well first of all, I'm never gonna fly alone. Like I'm always gonna have a visual observer or a camera person. I always need to have one person with me that I know knows the drones like I do. That's for safety reasons, that's for all the reasons. You're gonna have two people, so you gotta be cognizant of, of paying two You're people. You're paying two people, yeah. You're paying two people no matter when you fly. So you should always fly with two people regardless of what drone it is. Um, but the way that I figured out the pricing is uh, I actually called a bunch of other drone companies in the area and just asked them, I'll just price what, them out the same What do they drone charge? Yeah. yeah, what do you charge? I was just acting like I was a client. I was like, hey, I'm thinking about flying here. On that this was day. you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, pretty much. Secrets, yeah. yeah, and just like ask them, just like, hey, could you give me a quote? And then you just get a, a range of quotes from everybody that's in your area so you know who you're going against. Right. You get a range of quotes and then you, I just. Yeah, LA and Oklahoma City are probably a little different in terms of pricing, or LA and Austin. Exactly. Even, so. Yeah, depending on where you are, the prices change. In LA, it's obviously going to probably be a lot more because you're having, like, yeah, well, I'm a camera professional. And then, you know, if you go out into the middle of Oklahoma or wherever, a place that doesn't have that many camera professionals or drone people, then it's, you know, it could be way more or it could be way less. It just yep. depends on the market and, how, and what the need is. Um, but that's what I did. I figured out what the market was where I was, and then 
um, working with my clients, you normally get a good feel for it because you throw a number out, you know, you're like, I want $5,000 a day, and then nobody says yes. And you're like, okay, might be pricing it too high. $4,899. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the prices change. You know, as the drones come out, the, the cameras get better, the drones get easier to fly. There's one thing that changes is that um, I have a, a, a flying partner um, who used to fly, you know, from since 2011 or 12. And he had to build his drones, the octocopters. And, you know, back then it was like half the price of actually flying a helicopter because these people were experts with soldering and, you know, yeah, electrical yeah. engineering and all that. They had to be all that to be able yeah. to fly a drone. Mounting a DSLR on the bottom of it. Exactly. Yeah. It takes forever, you know, yeah. and it takes all this time and effort and money to be able to build these things. And now it's like you can go to DJI's website and buy a raw recording drone for $7,000, yeah. you know, out the door. So it's just like, okay, and it has GPS and it has all these yeah, things. Yeah, the barrier to entry has gone down. It's much for lower. Pilots. So it's just you got to be cogniz cognizant of that and really figure out what it is that you offer. Offer. That makes it so that you're worth um, more or as much as everybody else. Awesome. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, digital workflow in terms mm -hmm. of the files and the way that you manage files. I mean, at the end of the day, the product is those ones and zeros that you pull off the card. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that you never end up with nothing? Yeah, so it's pretty much um, before you start flying, first thing you always do is format your card. That's one of, that's one of the things on my checklist. Format the SD card, format the SSD card, whatever you're flying with. And then just have uh, one of those conversations you have with the client up front is, what do you want me to do with the footage afterwards? Um, and that depends on what kind of footage it is. The vast majority of drones are shooting the micro SD cards. So just like, cool, micro SD card, drop it onto a hard drive. Thanks for bringing your hard drive. Do you have a card reader? Do you have a laptop? I can bring a laptop. You just make sure you coordinate with them yeah. and figure that out. Now, there's also the other side of it where you have like the Inspire 1 um, RAW and the Inspire 2 have their own proprietary um, SSD cards. Uh, I know with the Inspire 1 RAW, because I fly that um, on a consistent basis, is that you know you have to have a proprietary, there's a whole workflow. Card reader. Card and reader, and then software, there's like extra yeah. software, yep. and it's a bunch of time. So normally I have to deliver the footage to the client afterwards or have time set aside after we're done filming to be able to allow a few hours to let the footage uh, translate to what it can be used for the client because they might not have that proprietary footage yep. I'm proprietary software to be able to change it over so it's just a conversation pretty yep. much just setting the expectation like I said before and you know just knowing what you have to deal with if they want raw footage or they want the ProRes footage or whatever they want then you got to realize oh, well this is what the workflow is going to be like and set the expectation. It's going to take longer or need a bigger drive. Do you typically hold on to footage after you've shot? Just, yes. Just as a, in case they say, hey, my drive crashed, can you, mm -hmm. you still have that? Yeah, so pretty, every single thing I shot, I shoot, like I just bought this huge, I bought a, a couple huge um, hard drives that I just keep in my house that I just have a backup of everything I've ever shot. Every client's different, so some of them are like, we want the exclusive rights to this, so we'll pay you more for this, or we want like, and that's going into like production company or like camera rights, IP rights, and all that about what you can and cannot use, have, or use for your reel, and that comes down to another conversation setting expectations with a client again. Um, but I still, uh, regardless of what I do with it, one thing I always will do is I back up all the footage that I ever get paid to shoot just in case a client ever needs it back, which makes client retention even better because they're yeah. like, oh, do you still have that we shot a year yeah. ago? Like, yeah, yeah, actually I do. Do you need it? Here you go. Yeah, well, wow, that's right. That's great you have that. Let's fly again. You know? Yeah, for sure. Um, what about like contracts, insurance, all the legal stuff? Uh, <laughs> how do you handle that stuff? Oh man, uh, it's, it's, that's a whole this video in itself. But to give you like the nutshell of it, um, with the contracts, um, one of the things I did again when I said reaching out to all those other companies, they'll send you their contracts. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, I guess that's so true. yeah, you can get your you can get your hands on their contracts, and then you know just kind of custom. I just kind of like cookie cutted it. Find and replace. Yeah, find and replace. Like here's you know you know here's not find and replace the name. You're hilarious. Um, but yeah, I did do that. Like find and replace, and then change out what I like and what I don't like, and take from other ones that I like and I don't like, and then just say here my I have a yeah. I mean, I, I know a couple lawyers, and I think even lawyers do that, right? They, yeah. No, nobody starts from scratch anymore. So yeah, um, why would so. you? Don't try to invent the wheel. Don't try to write your own contract. There's a yeah. bunch of them out there already, and yeah, you like I said, you go and talk to these other drone companies. They will, they'll give them to you. Just like yeah, okay, well let's go through the process of acting like a client. You don't have to pay them anything. Let me see what your contract looks like. Oh, okay, and then you just disappear. Um, but. Yeah, I mean that's what I that's what I did, and I just have my lawyer look over it afterwards. Um, I have an entertainment lawyer because I work in entertainment. Um, they look it over and they're like, "Cool, that works," and then it's good. And with insurance, um, I actually did a whole video specifically on insurance and the way to do on insurance. So check it out on Droner. Um, but all in a nutshell, just make sure you have a really good insurance agent um, and make sure that you're looking at what happens if there's a claim. Um, that's the biggest thing. Is obviously, yeah. price is what you're going to look at because how much does it cost to yeah. insure a drone? But if, you, if you're paying a cheap price and it doesn't cover what you need, then it doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. You're screwed when something happens. And if you also are super low budget, then there's the app called Verify um, that you can just get insurance on the spot uh, for like one flight or for one mm -hmm. day. It's like ten dollars, like minimum of like ten dollars an hour to fly or something like that, and it insures you. It's pretty good. So the app Verify does have limitations where you can't necessarily get a good big contract with a big client because you normally have to do uh, call, they're called COIs. 
um, where you have certificate to certificate of insurance, certificate yeah. of insurance to be able to provide it to a company at a time and say, no, I'm insured. I swear. Um, you can't get that from Verify. Verify is more like a hobbyist kind of thing where you're just like, I'm in a, I probably should have some kind of insurance where I'm flying. Um, I'm doing something that might be risky or I just don't fly all that often and I don't need to have yearly insurance and only going to cost me $20 every time I fly. Um, it doesn't have huge, like, uh, like a lot of insurance, you're looking at the amounts that they insure you for, for liability, $1 million, $2 million, $5 million, just depends on what the client wants. And Verify only goes up to like $1 million, so it's just like, it doesn't have very much. You right, know, most and some people want $2 million of liability or $3 million of liability. Exactly. So. Well, uh, B, this has been very informative. Um, I, I, there's a lot to it, right? And at the end of the day, this, this video isn't as much about Part 107 as it is the holistic approach to professional safe drone piloting. I'm super glad there's people like you out there doing that and giving the, the hobby and the profession a good name. So nice work. Keep I'm, it up. I'm excited to hear about your 107 results. That's what I'm yeah, excited about. Yeah, I, I want to know what you got so maybe I can beat your uh, <laughs> test score. You gotta, probably will. I got to win at something. <laughs> As I said, really appreciate this insight and you kind of taking the time to explain all these things. Um, you know, it's a holistic thing, guys. It's, it's not just uh, passing the test. Um, it's not just knowing the rules. It's, it's being smart, being uh, having common sense, and being safe at the end of the day and kind of giving our, our profession and uh, hobby, you know, depending on how you approach it, a, a good reputation and making sure that people get the value and the pleasure of seeing beautiful video without the risk of something bad happening. Yeah, right? I couldn't agree more. So uh, again, if you, if you enjoyed this, uh, definitely go over to Droner and subscribe to their channel because they do amazing stuff. They do, uh, they, they're very consistent with how they put out their uh, high quality content. And definitely, if you haven't subscribed to Ready, Set, Drone, we'd love to have you in the community. We'd love to have your comments below and we'd love to have you click that like button uh, where you can um, empower us to do more cool stuff here on Ready, Set, Drone and Droner. Thanks for watching.